This is the sermon for the Sunday of the Transfiguration. This morning we are reading from Mark's Gospel, the ninth chapter, beginning with the second verse. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured before them. His clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them. A voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The reading appointed by the lectionary begins after six days. So this seems like a good place to begin. Six days after what? For the answer to that, we need to turn back to Mark chapter 8. We may read, beginning with verse 31, He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days, rise again. He said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. So Jesus has just unloaded a whole lot of painful truth on his disciples. And this, by the way, comes right after an episode of miraculous works healings, and the mysterious feeding of an enormous crowd. Jesus describes his suffering and death, and Peter, it seems, objects. And then Jesus puts him in his place, or maybe keeps him out of the place he wants to go. Whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. Then six days passed, almost as if Jesus and his wisdom understood they'd had enough for a while. They needed a little time to digest what they've just seen and heard. Sometimes I wonder just how much of that we are missing in our modern world. Time to fully digest what has just taken place before moving on to the next thing. Our world is so preoccupied, it seems, with the next big thing. The current thing is hardly understood before it is rejected in favor of what's coming over the horizon. Even in the church, the way we tend to worship in the 21st century often strikes me as frenetic. Every space seems to be filled with something as modern liturgy cannot withstand the perceived vacuum of silence or the stillness of meditation. So, six days later, Jesus takes Peter and James and John up to the top of a mountain. We might speculate as to why only those three. Were they the inner circle? the ones who perhaps most exuded leadership qualities. 
Well, maybe just the opposite. Were they possibly, of all the disciples, the ones who least understood, and thus most needed to see something even more spectacular? The end of our reading tells us that Jesus charged them to keep what they had experienced themselves until he mentions it again after his death and resurrection. So what does it all mean? Possibly we might ask ourselves, what did it mean for Peter, James, and John? But more importantly, what, if anything, does it possibly mean for us? As is often the case, I'm certain that we might look at this astounding vignette in any number of ways, and over the years I've certainly come across some excellent exegesis regarding the Transfiguration. I would, by the way, commend to you the work of Tom Truby and Paul Neuterlein on this topic, to name just a couple. But here is what I would like for us to consider. The authors of the Gospels, the authors of the New Testament, in fact, the authors of anything, are charged with the responsibility of getting us to focus on what they consider important, to make a distinction, as it were, between the main points and the supporting details. In our day and age, that's comparatively easy for modern storytellers. If in a movie or a television show, a character's facial expression, for example, is crucial we can cut to the close-up. The eye and the attention of the viewer is drawn, mechanically, as it were, to the thing that is thought to be important. But when all we have are words, and slowly, probably painfully, hand-lettered words at that, the task of getting the audience to pay attention to what's really important requires a whole other level of skill. When we read the story of the Transfiguration, we're naturally drawn to the spectacular details, the most obvious and touted, the way Jesus' very clothing seemed to become different, whiter than anyone could bleach them, as the text says. But perhaps even more amazing, there's the appearance of Moses and Elijah, so often in sermons said to be representative of the law and the prophets. Finally, then, there's the voice of God, echoing in a way it was heard at Jesus' baptism, This is my beloved Son. And while all of that was surely wondrous, and we might speculate endlessly about what those details mean. For example, a poet I was once acquainted with, a very good poet and decidedly learned one at that, wrote a beautiful piece on Moses and Elijah's appearance and relativistic time. Somewhat less heady, but still as speculative, are the numerous times I have heard the incidents of Moses and Elijah's brief cameo-like appearance as proof of a conscious life after death. And to be sure, that's all great stuff. But I believe the point, for us, is not so much what the Transfiguration tells us Jesus is, or what this is all about in its glorious, otherworldly detail, but rather what Jesus is not, and therefore what we, his followers, are not to be about. Jesus takes the three disciples up to a mountain, and there they see Moses, to be sure, considered by every Jew to be, if not the giver, at least the bringer of the law. And then there's Elijah, considered by many the greatest of the prophets, the one whom many thought that John the Baptist and then Jesus were reincarnations of. And of course, Peter 
does what humans have always tended to do, put up structures to memorialize and in some way make permanent our experiences. Wow, says Peter, this is really, really good. Let me build some, some buildings for you, for you holy people. And of course the authors of Mark are quick to point out Peter at this juncture really didn't know what to say. So he just started blurting out something, the first thing he thought of, a building plan. And it is at that exact moment, according to our text, right when Peter is about to launch off in a direction that nobody but Peter actually wants, things get cloudy, and they hear the voice of God. And God here seems to be a deity of few words, saying only, this is my son, listen to him. As if God is saying, no, don't listen to your own ideas. Don't start building a bunch of huts. That's really not what's needed. And then Moses and Elijah are gone. No one is there but Jesus. So perhaps God is saying, I know the law is handed to you by Moses is important to you. I know the prophecies by which you believe you can understand what you are to be about and where you are going are really important to you as well. But the one you need to pay attention to, the one you really need to listen to, is Jesus. And as if to illustrate the point, Moses and Elijah vanish before they can say anything the disciples can hear. The spotlight is now on Jesus. A camera panned Jesus. The Gospels describe him as being transfigured, glowing, shining. Look at him. Look to him. No, don't look to the law, not even the prophets, but rather to Jesus. As a matter of fact, you couldn't possibly understand the law and the prophets until you look to Jesus. So they learn quickly, it's not about the law. It's not about the prophets. And it's definitely not about building structures to hold this moment in stasis forever. So what then is it about? As they're coming down the mountain, Jesus tells them, Keep this little incident to yourselves until after my resurrection. Maybe that's why he picked the three he did. They may have been the only one he knew could keep a secret. I'd hate to have that task. Almost as bad as those people who were healed, whom Jesus then instructed, but don't tell anyone how this happened. Of course, that's not really the important part. The important part, at least this morning, is that the vignette closes in the same way it was introduced, with a discussion of Jesus' impending death and resurrection. That is the important part. It's not about the law. Of course the law is important, as are the prophets, but it's not about the prophets either. And there's even a time for building things, but it's definitely not all about that. And finally, it's not about staying in the place of mysterious theophany. It's not about being stuck with or in some kind of religious experience that we cannot really make sense of. Okay, men, says Jesus, you've been shown what I'm not. And I've told you and I've shown you what I am. And soon you will see and hear even more. So let's go back and join the others, for there's work to be done. So we who follow Jesus, as we endeavor to minister to the world around us, need to be mindful of the fact that the truest answers, strange as it sounds, are not to be found in the law, useful as the law may be. 
a list of do's and don'ts will never truly bring about a renewed world. It's possible, with enough force, the law, or any kind of written belief system, may keep order for a while, although in the long run it will more likely spur dissension. My God wants this. Well, my God says this. And soon the terrible swift sword seems to rapidly follow. The answers will no more be found in the prophets. At least no complete answer will be found there. For while I may hold Elijah and his sayings to be sacred, or the writings of Isaiah to be something to pattern one's life after, what of those who have never heard of such individuals, or have their own prophets, or more likely simply don't care? What matters is the work of Jesus, the fully human one, the one who went willingly to a sinner's death, forgiving his executioners, the one who made a mockery of death, reminding the world that ultimately there is no need to fear. We who follow Jesus will do best as we seek the renewal of the world when we focus on forgiveness. We concentrate on the boundless life that transcends the very worst that the powers of evil the originators of death culture can dish out. The world will be changed and reborn, not by another building program, not by another memorialization of what we have felt about some religious experience or ideology, but rather by forgiveness and the love that conquers even death. Mm -hmm.